I'd like to call the order the Public Safety Highway Facilities Needs Assessment Feasibility Committee for Wednesday, January 26 at 9.03 a.m. First on our agenda is a uh, report from the Police Department on their needs. Thank you. Start out with a um, little bit of overview. We discussed it briefly before, but in 1993, the, this building, which was the old high school and uh, the current town hall, was um, remodeled in the basement for the police department. So in 93, the department had eight full-time officers and three full-time dispatchers and 10 part-time officers and only had four cars at the time. There was a chief, one sergeant, and six patrolmen, and three full-time dispatchers. Now, in over the years since then, we've practically doubled in size. Currently, we have 15 full-time officers. We have a chief, lieutenant, detective sergeant, three patrol sergeants, and nine full-time patrolmen. And four, four full-time dispatchers, uh, four part-time dispatch right now, and three part-time patrolmen. We run three shifts a day, seven to three, three to 11, 11 to seven, 365 days a year. Um, typical day shift for the seven to three, you always have one dispatcher on duty, myself, the lieutenant, detective sergeant as admin, detective sergeant doubles as the uh, detective and the accreditation manager, so he's either doing cases or he's doing accreditation stuff, which is in and of itself is a full-time job. Uh, we have the SRO on, and routinely two patrolmen in addition to the SRO. However, if someone takes a day off, someone calls out, or if we're shorthanded, we'll run with one patrolman in the SRO. Um, and between myself and the detective and the lieutenant, we'll handle calls. Um, so there could be at any time during the day up to seven people on during the day, including the three admins. Yep. And just for everybody watching, the SRO is a school resource officer. Right. It isn't just so. Yep. School resource officer who's on an admin schedule works Monday through Friday during the school year. Um, and depending on what's going on in the summer, we'll most likely leave him on that schedule and he'll fill in uh, patrol during that time. So 3 to 11 shift, uh, one dispatcher. Um, usually one patrol sergeant and two to three patrolmen, and again, that depends. I like to schedule a sergeant and three patrolmen, but if someone takes a day off, it could be sergeant two patrolmen, and if somebody's out, I mean, the minimum we'll run with is two. So you, at any point in time on three to 11, you could have three to five guys, minimum of three up to five in the station at a time. 11 to seven, one dispatcher, patrol sergeant, and one patrolman. Um, there could be a split shift depending on if we're fully staffed and everybody's um, on schedule. Sometimes we'll run a seven at night till three in the morning split shift. Um, ideal staffing for me, in my mind, for each shift would be a sergeant and two patrolmen. Uh, three to 11 shift would be a sergeant and three patrolmen and uh, the overnight would be a sergeant and two patrolmen. We're not there yet. I would need probably 17 full-time people to get there and to be able to run that amount of people um, on a routine basis <coughs> without without so, backfilling. Yep. Yeah. So looking at this, you're um, you're missing the the sergeant for the patrolman on days now currently. Right. Yeah. Right. We ha we don't have a sergeant uh, assigned to day shift. I figure with myself and the lieutenant. Right. Um, yep. Um, for our fleet, we have what we consider five line cars. Line cars are what we consider the, the cars that are rotated between patrol and the patrolman. So we have five of those that are rotated and usually they're split between two people. The supervisors right now drive 732. The other cars are divided up uh, amongst the patrolmen. We try and keep two people in a car and run it so that car at least has an eight hour turn where it's just sitting there. We don't like to run, try not run a car 24 hours right. a day. So we try and do that uh, strategically. We have three admins car, admin cars. I have a car assigned to me, the lieutenant has a car assigned to him, and the detective sergeant has a car assigned to him. 
Um, we have one old cruiser, uh, 2013, that when we did the turnover, we kept two to use for details and other things that came up. Well, in we got the canine, uh, the comfort dog, who needs a uh, canine insert in the back. So I have that car assigned to the canine. I have uh, a guy on the drone unit who's uh, on call all the time. So I have that car assigned to the drone where he has all his equipment in there. So he's ready to go at any point in time. Again, those are the the two that we kept, they're 2013s, and we kept them when we did the change over to the newer cars. We weren't going to get much for them, so we were going to keep them, use them for details. So we, we still use them for details or whatever the department needs if, if we needed those. So we have also two unmarked cars. Uh, one of those cars was seized um, in a drug investigation, so it didn't cost us anything. The other one we purchased with narcotics monies, and, and those are used for undercover operations and for the drug task force and whatever we do for surveillance outside of uh, needing a marked car. We have the two ATVs. We have the trailer for the ATVs. We have a speed trailer message board. One of the main speed trailer and message board we leave in our garage. Um, that that's the one that we use. It can do uh, does reports for us. It can do traffic studies. Um, it's a message board, radar board. So we keep that one at the station. But John, you might be able. To, we got four other ones from construction projects. Mm -hmm. A couple of them are at the water department. We 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 have three or four of them, but we keep the main one at the at the station. The other ones are stored at the water department. Sometimes Mark lets us store them down at his mill if we need the room. So our current facility, we estimate, is about 5,700 square feet. Um, the building that they were in before they moved to this building, they were above the post office, and there was two offices. It, it Lucky if it was 600 square feet. They, the chief had an office, and then there was a, an office to do paperwork and, and booking. So there's two small rooms above the post office. So uh, it was a huge jump in what they moved into from what they were at. Um, we'll start off with our, our lobby area. Uh, when you come into the station, so I'll, that lobby can fit probably about three people comfortably. Um, without getting overcrowded. You can see in that picture our drug boxes to the left where people can come and drop off old um, prescription drugs. Our lobby window, which is right in front of the, the drug box here, to, uh, if you're facing the drug box, it would be to the left. I got some prices to replace that window and it's up to like $5,000 uh, on bids. It's thick, thick glass. The problem with what we have now is there's no hole. Right. Microphone hole, so I mean, you literally have to yell back and forth, and you know, either go out into the right. lobby and talk to somebody. You really, you can't talk to somebody through the glass. So, I looked at getting uh, that replaced, and it, you know, it's pretty expensive. Five thousand dollars. They would have to replace that whole uh, piece of glass there and put in the the microphone. We got a public bathroom uh, in the lobby. Um, and one chair for people who come in. Uh, there's no ventilation in there. Um, you know, with the COVID the past couple of years, you talk about social distancing. We have more than one person coming to the lobby. Even if one person came into the lobby, what we would normally do is step outside with them, depending on the weather. Um, you know, we have people drop drop off, uh, do child exchanges, uh, restraining order stuff, and you know, they come into the lobby. Sometimes it, I mean, it's really easy for it to get crowded. You'll see out in front, of the glass door, you get that drain, that small drain out there. Um, if we get tropical down, uh, downpours in the summertime, uh, this will, it can't handle, that drain can't handle the water, so the water will come in through here, and it happens at least two to three times a year, I would say. We had to call Adam down there. I mean, we've had water that will come in so fast, it, it'll get down to like the cell area right down the hallway if you don't keep up with it. Um, Again, it happens at least two times a year, most of the times in the summer, when you get the heavy downpours. Next page is going to be the IT room, and that's right off, right across from dispatch. When you come into the, the station, it's off to the left. It used to be an, um, like an old, just an interview office type room. Um, so in there, we have our servers, our backups, 
um, our radios. Where that chair is right now um, is going to be a rack for the new radio stuff. So that whole south wall is probably going to be taken up by whatever new radio stuff we have. There's no ventilation in that room. Um, we have switches and equipment that are pretty much stacked up on each other with no circulation. Um, it is secure. I mean, we run into problems with um, sometimes with accreditation we have to get waivers. It's a secure room. It has a lock on it. Um, but even with the window there and the glass window, I mean, that, for all intents and purposes, our argument when it comes to accreditation and, and best practices is our whole building is secure because you have to get buzzed in. You're not, no one's just walking into the mm. station. But certain rooms, they want, you know, security. Um, locks on doors, which we have for that room, but even with the glass window, they would consider that not 100% secure. Moving on to our, we have one interview room. This interview room we built, actually uh, Lieutenant Brown built it probably about 10 years ago. They came out with new case law that every interview of a suspect needed to be audio and video recorded. We didn't have a room for that, so we had a this is right across from where the refrigerator and the kitchen is. So it used to be like a dining area. We took that out. We petitioned this off, and we made it an interview room. And we put in audio video equipment. There again, no ventilation in that room. Um, and we have one one room right now that we can do audio and video recording, and I think we should have at least two. Across from that interview room, you'll see the, the kitchenette area on the next page. Um, again, the, where the interview room is now used to be a dining room table, and that's where the guys used to eat. Uh, the stove in the kitchen, the stove top hasn't worked for years. Basically, the guys used the microwave, and we have the refrigerator there. Next page, men's locker room. Um, we're, we ran out of lockers. Um, we don't have enough for all of our employees. We have 17 lockers in that locker room, and we have 21 male employees. Um, the changing room, we believe, should be a little bit bigger. There's one shower back there in a bathroom that needs to be updated. Um, these lockers here, you can see in the beginning to the right, that's the hallway going down to the locker room. So guys who have these lockers, the lockers actually open up and you're in a hallway. There's not enough room for, so if you're at shift change, three to 11 shift change is usually a disaster because guys from day shift are going in and guys three to 11 are getting ready. So all you hear is a bunch of clanging, guys bumping into each other's duties belts and handcuffs and lockers. Next page is gonna be our uh, woman's locker room, which is over to the left. You'll see there's, it's small. There's five lockers in there. Um, and right now we have four female employees and there's no shower in there. So if you go in that top page, you walk in, their lockers are to the right and to the left, they have a uh, bathroom facility in there. Uh, it's just a bathroom and no shower. What is this thing on the floor in front of the locker? Fridge. Fridge, toaster oven, a little George Foreman. Next page uh, is. I think every woman's locker room should have a George Foreman. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Got to have it. Hey, you can paninis for lunch. Uh, so the next page, we go to the sergeant's office. That is, um, it's a shared office space for two sergeants. You can see it's cramped. It's small. Uh, we have two desks in there, so they each have their own desk. There's really not enough room to. You see the chair off to the left. So if they have to talk to somebody or have somebody in their office, it's, it's tight quarters. Um, so we have two sergeants that share that office. Next page, we have the evidence room. And this is just an open door shot, quick look into it. So you can see it's, it's fairly small. There's no area for bulk storage. There's no processing area. There's no ventilation in there. We got a um, I think Adam got a price from Renard looking to put, because when we used to have, well, we don't have as much now, but in the marijuana in there, I mean, it would literally stink up the, the whole 
building. I mean, they could smell it up here at, at some point. So we looked at putting an exhaust fan to run it all the way out, and it was going to be close to like $10,000. Um, so we didn't make that move. But uh, there's no one-way temporary storage. A lot of these new evidence rooms um, that are up to date, they have the old, I don't know if you remember the old like uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken window, you go there, turn around, spin, yeah. and you put it in there. We literally have, if you look on this door, it's an old office door, we got a little like mail slot at the bottom. So you can put small things in there, but we use other lockers for uh, temporary storage, for bulk storage. And again, an updated evidence room should would have a, a big one-way door there and it would have a area for processing. You'd have your own computer there. Everything would be barcoded and you know put right into the computer so the evidence custodian could go in there and, and actually work. He, everything that's put in this room has to be processed from the outside and then brought in there at the end. So you got evidence going from one place probably to the evidence custodian's office. He's processing it, putting everything in the computer, and then he's bringing it into the evidence room. Next picture is right down the hallway uh, from the evidence room. It's our armory, which is basically a closet. Even though we have done a lot of work to it, we got a couple of racks. Um, it's small. We put the rack in. Uh, again, no, there's no ventilation in there. That's where we store all our ammo, um, firearms, um, anything related to fire, uh, firearms training and the targets and all that stuff goes in there. But it, it actually looks bigger in this picture than it than it really is. It's uh, just a small closet. Well, it looks like you could fit one person in there. Yeah, you, literally, because when we do get ready to go to uh, training, one guy's one guy goes in and slides the <laughs> cases of ammo out, and then we take it back out through the uh, sally port. <laughs> Next two pictures of the booking room and probably the the best room that we have in the department. Really, it's it's big enough for what we do. You don't want that area too big. Um, so that right there is the uh, the open area between the, the booking desk and uh, w where we bring the prisoners in. And then you can see the hallways for the cells. The booking area in and of itself, it, I, I think, is adequate for what we need. We run into a lot of problems with the cells. We have cell inspections at least twice a year. DPH comes in and does a cell inspection, and regardless of what we do, they, they'll, and it's like that with every department, but they'll find something wrong. Um, so we have to write a letter, we have to write what we're gonna do to fix uh, you know, the problem. Like there's very, you know, they'll find um, a small space in the, in the sink or something where somebody could put a shoelace. It's anything that they can find that suicide risk chipping paint on the floor. I mean, we, we paint the floors, rust inside the toilet. I mean, we have the toilets cleaned. I mean, it's it's nearly impossible to pass a DPH inspection. I think we've literally passed it once, and I know everybody runs into that problem with them. But if we were to stay here for an extended period of time, we're gonna have, we would have to upgrade these uh, toilets and sinks. They're just at end of, end of use. They're just, we can't keep them clean. Um, we have a problem with the water temperature. We've actually failed inspection for that because the, the hot water in the cell has got to be uh, a certain temperature. Adam's helped us with that a couple times from the thermostat, and, but um, we would need some upgrades there. Uh, for, as far as cells go, we have three that we're active, actively using. We have one in the back. Uh, for juveniles, which we really, since they change the juvenile law, very rarely will we have a juvenile in custody. So we could have up to four cells if we need it. This next picture is uh, right outside the booking room. This uh, is the senior sergeant's office. Um, uh, interrupt there for a minute. Sure. You said four, up to four cells, that's what you have now? Yeah, we have uh, labeled one woman cell two male cells and we had a juvenile cell in the back because juvenile is supposed to be sight and sound separated. So it's kind of around the back towards the records room. So it's not, if you look at this, uh, when this booking room photo on, this, on the bottom photo, you'll see over to the left, that's the female cell. If you go down this hallway, there's a cell on the left and a cell on the right. Now if you went back towards the 
the records room, back there there's another cell, sight and sound separate from the adults. But again, very rarely uh, would we, we probably wouldn't even put a juvenile, in, in this day and age, a juvenile in a cell. If, it, if we arrest a juvenile, they're there for a short period of time and we, we wouldn't put them in a holding cell. We'd keep them across from dispatch or someone would monitor them until their parent or probation came and picked them up. So we could utilize a fourth cell, uh, a fourth cell if we needed to. And it's rare that we very rarely have more than two or three prisoners at a time. You might have, you know, the majority of the time you get one, you may have a dual arrest. Holiday weekend. Yeah, but there have been times where the cells have been full for the weekend. All depends. Timing is everything, <laughs> you know? Otis doesn't come anymore, huh? What's that? Otis? No. <laughs> no. Um, so, yep, with Senior Sergeant's office, it's just small, uh, again, cramped, um, no ventilation, no window, no air system in there. How much stuff does he have plugged into that receptor? Yeah. Uh, I think he's, yeah, he's got a shredder, a couple other things. So moving over to dispatch. So this area you can see is crowded where the dispatch console is literally used to be one desk, one computer, and a computer screen on it. And then we used to have the old uh, leap system where it used to be the uh, um, just a computer in a, a printer. Now we have, you'll see in this console we put in a couple of years ago, there's eight screens, there's monitors on this wall, there's a monitor on the other wall. If you look back left towards the window, you see the computer over there, that's the second PSAP. If we ever needed a, a backup PSAP or if we're getting overrun here, you could answer the other 911 line over there if there was somebody else in. We've had instances where um, you know, we've had major incidents, tornado, fire, and our dispatchers are pretty good. If they hear stuff on the radio with like one dispatcher is going crazy, uh, there's been numerous times Hannah has heard it and she would come in and, and help and she would take over at this, this second position over here. Um, there's a desk over there, uh, another phone. Um, it's just crowded and walking around here, uh, around the edges, there's, there's little room um, I don't know exactly much, but it ain't much more than 24 inches. Another thing with the, the dispatch center is we got a waiver for it. Again, accreditation and best practices is that the dispatch center should be a room in and of itself within the building, like walled off with door. Um, we got a waiver for that, again, because you know we wrote it up as the whole building is secure. Um, but they like to see the dispatch center as a room in and of itself, separate from everything Control else. space. Separate from everything else. Back, uh, next page, uh, Lieutenant and Detective Sergeant share an office in the back. Um, we put a couple of new workspaces in there, but again, the, uh, the Detective Sergeant uh, should probably have his own office, because again, he doubles as the accreditation. This these. Uh, files here and the ones above his desk are full of accreditation stuff um, on top of his cases so um, they work days together I mean so they share their space but um, in a perfect world they would both have their uh, own offices. Next room is a training meeting room. Um, it's too small to fit our whole department. We can fit we put everybody in there, it's 25 to 30, but it's very tight. We have a conference table in there that has six chairs. Um, so you, you could have a meeting in there with half your department or a quarter of your department and fit comfortably. But putting everybody in there, it's crowded and small. We, we certainly wouldn't host a training for 20 to 25 people in there, just not big enough. Um, in addition to, if over to the left, I didn't get a picture of it, but we have a desk in a couple of file cabinets up against the, the wall. So if you're facing the backdrop, 
to the left where you come in with the door, there's another desk up against the wall with a computer and a couple of file cabinets. That's where my administrative assistant keeps all her stuff. Years ago, that, that sen senior sergeant's office used to be Patty's office um, when she was the administrative assistant. And, and then when she left, we didn't fill that position for a while. So the senior sergeant moved into there. And then when I got the administrative assistant back, I didn't have anywhere to put her stuff so she keeps file cabinets in this training room with her desk, and there's a computer on there. So she yeah. keeps all her stuff back there. That room will uh, currently fit how many people? When we put everybody in the department, we have a meeting for either you know Oktoberfest, Memorial Day parade, uh, department meeting. We have, but any time we can have between 25 and 30 employees. No, but, it, but yeah, how many do you fit in that room? Oh, you can fit 25, uh, 25 to 30, but it's, it's Comfort crowded. Comfortably, comfortably, yeah. comfortably, probably half that. We have six on the... Uh, so the 12 to 15 people? Yeah. Any more than that, you're overcrowded. Like I said, well, we have our, our briefings for our parades and whatever. We put everybody in here, and it's, it's just chairs. We have to move the conference table around and just put single chairs around the ends. Yeah. You just can't fit everybody in there comfortably. And the reason why I'm, I keep asking these little questions, this is what I'm trying to get to, is what our current situation is and what we need. So as right. each meeting we're getting closer and closer to being on that. Um, so that's why I was just curious how mm -hmm. many people fit in that room. Yeah. So when we put the whole department in there for, um, like I said, a parade, Memorial Day parade is usually the biggest one. Everybody, it's all hands on deck for a couple hours, so we have our briefing in there, and it, there's no space at all. Um, next page is our records area. So if you go to the back of the station, this first top picture is what you're going to see. That's the first door going down the hallway. We uh, bought some racks the past couple of years. We've been buying one a year and we've been moving records yearly further back. So the further the time goes along, the further back you go. So if you look at the, the top picture is, is our first alleyway. Those are our most recent records. If you move to the next picture, that's behind this the door in this first picture, which is way back and you'll see that these filing cabinets and everything are up on pallets because we get water back there as well. We've, we've had records ruined and boxes soaked uh, numerous times. So those records from the previous years get moved back every year. And then if you go to the next page, it goes to the way back room. That's off to the left of the second room. So kind of if you were in the back of our station by like the sally port and the generator, this is where this room would be. And you, water gets in through that wall. These are some old, old file records. We try and keep everything out of this room now simply because you never know if, you know, we get a heavy, wet, wet rain, it'll seep right in through that wall. Um, so we try and keep everything out of there. But those are some of the, where we keep the records. And usually by the time we get to this point where they have to go in here, we can almost start uh, purging because a lot of the stuff is a computer now. Um, so when we no longer have to keep the hot files of the records, we find it better just to you know, get rid of them. Mm -hmm. um, so there's no ventilation back there. The, the two back rooms are musty. Water leaks through the wall. And we just have to make sure that we keep the cabinets and everything off the floor because they could get ruined. Next page is the officer's room. Um, so when they first moved into the station, this room was, we did, we've done a lot of work to it, painted it, did the floor. It used to be carpeted. Um, and everybody, back when there were six full-time officers, they all had their own desk in here. Um, we weren't able to, to do that. Um, we just simply ran out of room, so we put in two workstations. Um, so there's two workstations in here that can be utilized by the people on duty. And there's another workstation out in the back in the training room that if there happen to be three people on, they could utilize that. And in addition, we have a computer back in the booking room. So if we ever had three or four people that were actually working, have to come in and read the log, 
you know, the, other than these two workspaces in the office's room, there's other computers that they could access either in the booking room or in the training room. Off of that um, officer's squad room is the 911 closet. That's where we keep the 911 equipment. Um, you, the It is vented, but it's tough to keep that room cool, so it's poor ventilation. It's crowded, and there's only between the rack in the wall, there's 16 inches there. And this is where all the 911 stuff is kept. So we need definitely need a uh, bigger IT room, uh, for not only for that 911 equipment, but for everything else that we have. Getting into the back of the station, we have the Sally Port Bay. And I just kind of took an open picture of that so you can see what we usually do is we would back into the Sally Port and take the prisoner in through that back door and that leads you into the booking room. So in the back of the station, if you're looking at the back of the station, we have uh, the two bays. We have the Sally Port Bay and the next page would be the uh, garage bay, which you can see is full of equipment, tires. The two ATVs are in there for storage. Um, if, we had, if we ever had the the opportunity to build a, another station, I would like to see at least, I think we need at least four bays. Two Sally Port bays that lead to the booking room, and then a garage to do some light mechanic work, and then a garage bay for, for storage um, for our trailers, for the ATVs, tires, etc. Next page, uh, we look at fleet parking. So. We usually have three cruises backed up to the to the back, and then whatever's being operated on that shift is out in in front of the Sally Port or the um, garage. Um, a carport is huge. I've looked at a lot of pictures of new stations, and the majority of them with the architects, they they have either have carports coming right off of the Sally Port, right off of the building, or something that would be back here. But to keep the, all the cars covered. Um, especially if you're adding to the fleet, I mean, it's key. I mean, I don't know if anybody saw the last snowstorm we had. So the, fortunately, most of the snow comes over, overnight. So the overnight shift starts all the cars, moves them all out there, gets them all cleaned off. John's guys come in, plow, then we can move, move the cars back. But with no, you get a heavy snowstorm, you got guys coming in, they're out shagging calls, and then in between calls trying to keep all the other cars cleaned off because you got other guys coming in. They're going to be getting into their cars, you know. So it, it's a chore mm -hmm. with a with a carport. It would be nice, nice protection for the cars year round. Um, so that's basically a tour of the station going through. When I looked at the bullets, um, I, I just tried to come up with some some answers to answer the bullet points, but I think you can see our, the, our common theme throughout this whole presentation is, is the lack of space and the size of the rooms that we have. Um, I think we what we have now is a shell of what we need. Um, we have almost everything that we need. We just need it to be two and a half to three times bigger. And I don't know, you know, th and that's for now. Um, looking into the future, it all depends on how how many officers we add, and how many um, how many officers we have, and how many more cruisers we add over the years. Um, we went through the fleet already, um, so I won't really address that again. Um, but as you can see, we talked about the carport, the Sally Port. We have two bays, um, and we're actually if the more cars we add. More people we add. If you, uh, I, I figure the per two officers, you'd have to add another car just to keep it in the rotation and make sure that not all these cars are getting hammered with with mileage. So on average, if you added an officer, you would add a car. Um, to identify where we are in compliance, best practices, right size for our, for our. Facility out of compliance, we would be in, in dispatch, like I said earlier, we were able to get a waiver for that for accreditation. Um, in secure IT rooms, we were able to get a waiver for that. Best practices, obviously the uh, evidence room we talked about, pro processing, secure storage, barcode. We meet um, 
what's expected of us for accreditation and even within the law when it comes to evidence, but it could be so much better. We're just, we're getting by with what we have. Um, looking at a, a estimate as far as uh, what community development and businesses moving into town, um, obviously there's gonna be an increase in call volume with economic development, even uh, residential. You, know, you look at even this warehouse that's, that's coming in, they're probably gonna be running 365 a day, three, 365 days a year, three shifts. That, you know, that could be two to 300 more people coming in throughout the day. You take the state park into consideration in the summertime, I was a state park, we, a couple years back, we looked at the numbers, they had over 100,000 visitors. That's over 100,000 people that are coming. <coughs> and those are the people that, that paid to get into the park. That's not the people that are coming to utilize the trails and mountain, <coughs> mountain bike and, and things like that. So you got another influx of 100,000 people in the summertime months coming through Douglas. And then you take the water slides. It's just a, a huge uh, increase in population. And I think these warehouses even the one that, that's going in over the line, Blackstone Valley Logistics, and the one that we're looking at putting in here is gonna have a, a huge impact over the next couple of years, traffic-wise and uh, population-wise. Um, I tried to project, if it, it, it's hard to project for a 30-year horizon, but uh, this is a, an estimate that I came up with. Like, right now we have 15 full-time officers, four full-time dispatches. In a perfect world, right now, I think we would be at 17 full-time officers, still four uh, full-time dispatchers. That would put us at with six cruises. Uh, I, I think a safe estimate is you look at every five years, over the next 30 years, adding probably two officers. Um, and if you didn't do that every five years, at least every 10, um, you would need to add two would be my guess. We look at, I, and I, I only say that because I look at when I started here in, in 1993 when they first moved into the station, we're almost double of what we were at then. There was, we had 10 part-time officers, they had eight officers, now eight full-time officers, now we're at 15 full-time officers, so we almost doubled. Is that influenced by population? There's, there's a couple ways to look at staffing. And you can do it by population. I think the FBI says you should have like there's like 2.4 full-time officers for every thousand people. That's one way to do it. You can look at call volume, right? Mm -hmm. See what you have for calls. And, but the way I look at it is, I look at it as you can't really predict when there's a major incident that's going to happen, right? Right. So I and you can't even do it. You can't say, okay, it's Saturday night. I mean, statistically looking at you, you're gonna to wanna to say, I, I should have an extra guy on. It would be nice to have three guys on three to 11 and maybe a swing shift, right? Fully covered. You could do that on a Saturday night and you could not get one call. And then that Tuesday at three o'clock in the morning, you could have the toughest call of the year, whether it be a, a, a major incident, shooting, whatever. You just never know when it's gonna happen. So when I look at staffing, I look at what, how do we staff it to be prepared for the worst, right? And we always do, we try to do that, but the, then what ends up happening? Okay, we got three guys on this shift, four guys on three to 11. Okay, a guy takes a day off. People have time off, I get it. So now are we gonna fill that one or, or are we gonna leave it open? Okay, we won't fill it. So now we're down to three guys. Now we make an arrest and a prisoner goes to, uh, <laughs> prisoner goes to the hospital. Now I gotta send an officer. So now you went from having four guys scheduled to down to two back down to two guys then and then you get this call that rolls in where you could use four officers it, it, it's so hard to right. predict I try and do I look at it like I have a hard time with the call volume simply because you just never know what's going to happen and you never know when it's going to happen the the formula for 2.4 people per thousand is is great if you can get up to that number but 
how are you staffing the shifts? I look at it like, like I say, I, in a perfect world, I would have a sergeant and two patrolmen on, on certain shifts. Like you look at the daytime shift, yeah, we have seven bodies on the daytime shift. That sounds like a lot. But when you have two banks in town and you have all schools up and running, that's when you, if something's going to happen, something major is going to happen, you need those bodies. You can't run a day shift with just two people and have a serious incident at the school. And you got two guys responding. So it's good to have the admin guys on during the day. And you, you, some people will look at that and say, oh, you got seven guys on during the day. What's everybody doing? Well, we're running the day-to-day -day operations as management and admin. And you got still got two patrolmen on answering calls, and you got the school resource officer. But if you have a major incident, you got seven of us going. Okay. And you don't only have two on. Same thing with 3 to 11. It would be ideal on a 3 to 11 to have a sergeant and three patrolmen. I'm confident that they can handle anything that comes in with that amount of people until we can get more people there. So I look at it like that. I, I try and do staffing as what, how are we going to be prepared to handle whatever comes in at whatever time. So, you know, I would look at it. Everything I would look at, call volume, I would look at statistics, but even you look at statistics, you, you could go throughout the year and you could pick that one day that seems to be the busiest and it's just Murphy's Law. You put extra yep. guys on that day and it's going to happen when you when you least expect it and you never expect it. Right. So I try and keep it yeah, consistent. All three uh, departments have the same challenges trying to figure out nobody's got a crystal ball. Right. Uh, exactly. That's what, exactly what it gonna, is. What's going to go on. Because you never know. You, you never know. You, you think like you guys could get a you know, you go, you get a major fire when you least expect it. Sunday, you, Sunday morning at, you know, yeah. four thirty in the morning. If you or look at our call mutual aid, yeah. If you look at our statistics, our very serious calls that require a full alarm response actually don't occur during our peak call periods. Yeah. So, trying to staff for only peak call periods can be put you in the predicament that you're describing. Right. So. The staffing is tough, and like I said, my best guesstimate, if we, were, if I had to go over 30 years, um, I think with the, it, it will depend on, I think the population of the town and what comes in for businesses, um, and where we are comfortably. I, I mean, looking at this, depending on the growth, I could only estimate like two additional officers every five years over 30 years that would put us almost at double of what we are 30 years from now. And as far as cars, you, you figure for every two officers you add, you got to add a car to the fleet. So we're not hammering all those cars, two guys assigned to a, a, a car. I don't know if we'll ever get there, but you look at the past, like I said, when we started here in 93, we were so small. Now, especially with the part-time officers that are going away, I have three left. Um, three that I'll be able to utilize until they get hired full time, and then I'll be probably down to one because of the police reform. The, the reserve officers are going away. When I first started here, there was eight full timers and ten reserve officers. So a lot of guys didn't want full time jobs, but you had a couple reserve officers who were working, you know, 24 hours a week. You know, they were covering up. It, it used to be so you would have one full, you could get away with that back then because you're like, well, how'd they get away with six full time officers? Because you had one full time officer on the road and then you would put a part time officer with them. So you're really, you, you get two for one, you're paying mm -hmm. that part time off the reserve officer back then, you know, not a lot of money and it's not costing you for overtime. So you get two guys on the road, but in the days of, and I'm, I'm glad we, you know, recognize that here. And the majority of departments, regardless of where you are, the days of working by yourself are are over in, in law enforcement. I mean, at the very minimum, I don't care where you work, whether it's Millville or not. There should be a small town. There should be two two officers on. Anyway, for me, that's just a safety mm -hmm. a safety point of view, but. Uh, and most departments in Commonwealth Massachusetts are there. Even the departments in Western Mass, you don't see anybody running less than one person. But um, identify some areas where um, that would help us 
um, if we put a public safety building together, I, I just put you, you know it would be centrally located building. I'm I'm sure we you know a public safety facility could have shared community room, maybe shared meeting room, training room, fitness room, um, shared IT storage depending on where you put it. Um, it would be shared dispatch, shared public lobby. Um, operational costs, I think regardless of whether we went public safety uh, facility or standalone buildings, for me anyway, at, at the police department, there will be an increase in, in expense. What it would be, I, I don't know. I can only tell you that here right now, I don't pay any heat, I don't pay electricity, I don't pay anything for internet, and I don't pay anything for water use. That's all paid by Adam and what he does um, for this building. So there would be an expense in my budget. I wouldn't even know where to begin on estimating fuel cost for that or any additional cost, fuel and uh, electricity. Um, but there would definitely be a, an increase in my operational cost. Sutton is the most recent value for the uh, so for the uh, yes and and Mark uh, was able to go over there yesterday with their lieutenant and, and take a quick tour. <coughs> I was there last week and took a look at their building. It's a beautiful building. It's about fourteen thousand square feet. They're about the same size as us. I think they they may be at seventeen full time people. Um, but Mark and I were just talking this morning, it's about 14,000 square feet from what I understand. And we don't know if they're looking at it. I don't know if they, and I don't know, I haven't seen the, the complete whole building, but they were talking to Mark. They looked at a build up for like two additional officers over the next 10 years. It's, I don't know if we would need more than that. Um, see if Mark has some input, but I look at it like, okay, I know that we have a shell of what we need, and I feel like right now for today's work, we would need two and a half to three times what we need. So then I have to look at, and I would leave it to the experts as far as the build out. What are they looking at? You even look at, I, I took another look online. You can go on and look at Bellingham. You can look at Grafton is 16 years old already. And it seemed like not too long ago that they just put up that building, and that was like, when that first came out, it was like, wow, compared to what they had, right? Mm. And still, I don't know, when you're looking at the future, I know we, if, if you ask me right now, and I, I could tell you, just based on what I know and what I've seen from these other departments, that at 15, within the next five years, maybe at 17, we would need, at a minimum, 14,000 square feet, based on what we're looking at here, 14 to 15, maybe 14 to 16, and that's, to get us probably through the next 10 years comfortably. So I don't know, I would have to leave it up to the architects and whoever's in the planning stages, but if we're going out 30 years, you're looking at almost, if, if things were to go the way they look like they're going with subdivisions coming in, with the economic development, are you looking at almost doubling in size like we've done since 93. So we're, we're one less than completely doubling our our size from 1993, right? So we're at eight, we're at 15. So if you go 30 years and 15 in 30 years, you're no longer 15, you're at 29, 30. Do we have enough space with the 14 to 16,000 square feet? And what we're looking at, you're looking at almost, if, if you get to that point in 30 years, I think I have what, you're, you're almost at 14 cars in, a, in and of itself just based on your patrol function. Looking at the uh, Sutton complex where you both and taught it, um, and you said that it appears that it has room for probably two more offices um, for growth in there, is that? I think that's what they, Plan for that's what they that's what they predicted. So so that's what they predicted. So you you two walk through it. How would that particular building fit your needs? Is that is that 
I mean, I'm not saying to build that building again. But what I'm, I guess, what I'm getting at is, they went to, already went through this whole process, um, and somebody came up with the idea that they needed a building of that size. Now that you looked at it, does that make sense to you, that size building? Uh, is there, is, like, <clears throat> did they give somebody an office this size and they only need one the size of that room? Um, yeah. Type of situation. So the square footage is a hard thing to, to use. I know I, I picked on Kelly and Adam when they, on both of them with square footage because it's hard to yeah, um, uh, yeah, get into it, your head as to what the space is. But the stuff like that, like currently they have one lieutenant, but they got two lieutenant offices. Yeah, the second lieutenant office is now just being used as miscellaneous offices. Right. So it's stuff like that they did plan ahead for. Yeah, so they have and, room. And right, I, I get what you're saying with the the square footage too. And you look at it like this. Even as you go further on, right? <clears throat> right now we run one dispatcher. We could run two. If we had to, if we ever got to that point, but that second dispatcher is yeah. going to be crowded in a corner space. Mm -hmm. <coughs> right now, we have one lieutenant. You double in size, you're probably going to have two lieutenants. You're going to have an administrative lieutenant, you have a patrol lieutenant. You're going to double. We have a detective sergeant, we have three patrol sergeants. You're looking, you almost double, you're going to have six patrol sergeants, especially if you're looking, okay, my, my ideal um, staffing is a sergeant on every shift with X amount of patrol, whatever you need for patrolmen to, to cover that shift appropriately. Right. So you're almost looking at doubling your sergeant space, doubling your lieutenant office space. You're, uh, we're looking at uh, an admin space for administrative assistant. Mm -hmm. You're looking at a full dispatch where you, we know that at the, at the very least, we go 30 years from now, we have additional, almost double the. You're gonna you're gonna go to two dispatch, probably two dispatch on duty, which a, a lot of departments are doing. I mean, I'm, we're not near Auburn yet, but Auburn runs two dispatch. Uh, Webster runs two dispatch, but they're regional. They they do more than one town. Oxford, I believe, is still running single. Grafton, I believe, is still running single. But you could get to the point where you're yeah. looking at at least probably. Day shift and three to eleven, probably running two dispatchers. Overnight, you probably get away with one. Okay, and so I was thinking, I'm thinking going through it, trying to understand, so I could uh, get it to you as of what I was thinking. So square footage wise, they have over in uh, Sutton, they have a drive under, so their their physical footprint is X amount of square feet. The same. Thing that I went through with Adam with the size of his building, how it's going to fit on the lot. That's going to help uh, Matt's part of the, in this equation as the figuring out do we have enough physical space? Uh, you don't have a location other than the basement of this, but if you, ha <laughs> if you were on the existing lot, um, do you have enough space that you could build your physical structure and still have room for expansion down the road? Because Obviously, we can't build a building now that's going to work in 30 years, but we have to make sure that it's designed, and that'll come out of, somebody else will be doing that, designed so it'll accept an expansion, but the space on the piece of property that it's on will also accept it. Yeah, Sutton, it's a really nice building. It's really well thought out, but with the lot, like you were saying, they're on it's multiple floors. They actually got mm -hmm. three floors lower up the first floor. In the helper floors as well, the HVAC equipment, so forth. I but ideally, it should be one one floor. Did you see if there was an elevator in there? There is an elevator. I, I was I was only there. in the training room last week for yeah. for a meeting with them. I mean, it, and it's beautiful. You come in to the main foyer, and the training room is off to the right, so it can be used as a community room too. You have to the key fob it in there. I mean, that's all something. I mean, we would look at too. And if you have a joint facility, a public safety building, I mean, that's something that we could conjoin, like we could have a, uh, a community meeting room. Like our lobby right now is tough because when they come in, we're either, depending on how many people it is, and the way it was with COVID, we're either taking him inside so you can talk privately or you're going outside. You're, and mm -hmm. routinely, recently it's been, okay, look, well let's go outside here and talk. We can have some privacy, we figure out what we need to do next whether we need to take you into the station to have a further you know, conversation or whether we can just get the basics out here. But 
what I'm seeing with some of these new stations is you, you know you come into the lobby and there's there's a room right off the side where with a conference table you can go in there you can sit down and figure out okay what do we have here is this something that we have to take this person into the interview room and get further in depth or is this something that we can talk right here and handle it out here you know in the in the community meeting room and then you don't even have people you know have them take them into the station into the audio video room I mean you know it's a, it's a place to me. So a lot of these new places are have have rooms like right off the right off the lobby. We clearly you know. Holden has a, a combined police and fire, and it's mm -hmm. like you described it. Right. They share the training room. Yeah. You come into that foyer, mm -hmm. and like you said, you filter out whatever you yeah. need to do. I, I believe Foxborough does I too. I think they're about has, six years old. Has the same thing. And yeah, if you go on that that architect's website, I want to say it's Kessel. <coughs> Excuse me. I want to say it's, but if you go on their website, they have all the projects that they did, and you can see the pictures, and it's pretty nice. I've got a few questions. Sure. Um, operational, anyway. Um, the interview room that uh, took over the dining area. Mm -hmm. When the, where, where do the, where the officers eat now? Since they don't have to squad room. Okay. We moved the. Uh, if you go back into, you might be able to see it. Where the two workstations are uh, on the other side of that, it's a multi-purpose room. It's a multi-purpose room. Yeah. So the yeah. So underneath the TV here, you can't see it, but underneath the TV here, there's a a table. Okay. So they'll utilize the microwave or whatever, and then they'll go into the squad. All right. So I got a couple other questions. Just like <coughs> so, you have that mail slot. In the evidence room for small storage, where does bulk storage go now into another room? Temporary locker will use, uh, and, and it depends on how big it is mm -hmm. and what it is. If it's something that's not going to fit in the temporary locker, evidence custodian gets a call and gets an hour overtime because he's going to come in. Mm -hmm. Only one person has access to that evidence room. Mm -hmm. I don't even have access to it. I don't want it. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it's one guy. So if something happens, he knows where it is, and the, the chain of custody is the, they don't have to look very far as to what happened to something. So, um, right now, yeah, we use a temporary, we have temporary lockers out back. So, what they'll do is if they get something that they can't fit through that slot or in there, temporary locker locks it up, key goes into the evidence envelope, and gets put into the evidence room little mail slot that we have. The temporary locker? Temporary locker, temporary locker. Would that be a patrolman's locker? No. Okay. We have some designated in the back. <laughs> okay. I just try to see what we're multi purposing, you know? Um, there's no processing room in there. Where is processing room? No processing room in there. So when he has to process, if we're processing evidence for <clears throat> like fingerprints or something like that, it's in the back of the book room, booking room that the crime scene guy will do. Mm -hmm. If there's evidence, bulk storage or whatever it might be, um, firearm, goes to the evidence custodian, goes into the temporary locker, he'll take it into his office, he'll process everything, he'll give it a property number, he'll put everything in the computer, and then he'll place it in the evidence room. But all that, in an ideal world, would be done in the evidence room from start to finish. We'd have a barcoded system and everything. Like the way Sutton has it? <coughs> Officers on the outside, they got lockers. You put the evidence in a lock, you push a button, the lock is locked. Evidence guy goes inside, opens the back door. <laughs> so, no yeah. one can get to it. Okay. Uh, data backup. You mentioned there's no backup, at least there, there is on site. Is there off site data backup? I know the answer to this one. Or is it cloud based? Oh, but That's a question for Mark. Which is more or less to Dave, but. <coughs> Leave that to Dave to answer. I was just curious if it's something there for lacking in backup of data yeah, or if it's sufficient or not. But an, an ongoing project. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. My last question is more of a curiosity. Um, the K9 vehicle, I think you said it's a car. Is it an SUV? <laughs> it's an SUV, okay. yeah. Is this, just yeah, it's Ford, uh, uh, Ford SUV. Okay. No, I'm just and we just took the. Uh, what we did was we took the back seat out and I used uh, 
some drug money, forfeiture money that we have, and I bought a uh, canine insert for it. Somebody takes the dog up to the school, and it's got fans in there and an alarm, right. everything to keep the dog cool. comfy, cozy, so he can do his, mm -hmm. do his job. <laughs> yeah, to keep the comfort dog comfortable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Female patrol officers. Um, oh, they, uh, no, don't have a shower. So no shower in the shower on, no shower in the female locker room. Yeah. We have one female officer, yeah. three female dispatchers. Mm -hmm. so share the locker room. Can only share the shower. <laughs> chief. Uh, chief, um, you started in '93. Before that, there were handcuffing people to the register. Yeah. Um, so you've come 20 years, 25 years or so, which is where we're trying to forecast out. You've got you've got four cells as it is. If you're adding officers, that would mean more arrests as well, probably. Uh, did we did we think about extra, lo um, I'm not lockers, cells, and then your booking area is good for what you have now, but if right. you look 30 <clears throat> down the road, could be a busier place, so is that part of what you included yeah, in I the conclusion? Yeah, I would think if we were going to look at a, at a new building, they would look at that booking room area and the space and how they come in, because even when you do a, a new facility, you're basically bringing them in the sally port. You, you, and if you do it right, you have literally no contact with that prisoner. You put them in a room, they have a room where you go in, you take all his property, whatever, and then you put them right into another room and you do all the booking right from there. So, yeah, to answer your question, I think we would be sufficient with four cells, but they would probably look into the future, probably do four to six. <coughs> would you uh, have to provide a a separate locker room for the event uh, in the event that we had a transitional employee. I don't know. I believe there was some talk that the Plainfield run into that issue. Yeah. Then we've talked about it the last couple of meetings. I just want to just keep bringing it up to all three departments because it's, it's just reality. It's something that we have to acknowledge at this. Yeah, that, I think that's something Stage. that we would have to... Um, Just in your notes, you didn't have nothing in there, so I don't know if it's you or Mark, that's, but you might want to keep that as part of your into planning process. A, I don't even know if we would, have, would it have to be a third space, or do you have two designated spaces and maybe a, a smaller third space? I don't know. I think that would all come to probably, by the time... <laughs> where there would be some type of building code to issue, I would think, or suggestion, perhaps? That would be human resources, wouldn't it? Well, building code is still driven by gender, mm -hmm. so I'm sure there will be attention paid to it. You can also waive provisions to building code. <clears throat> I think if we're forward-thinking people, we would have all bathrooms be gender neutral and they would be properly equipped for possibly <coughs> That would be the most cost-effective way to do it. The notion that we're going to build one with urinals and another without, and a third one with everything, it, this is stupid. And I right. think that's what the chief of Plainville was complaining about. They just finished my building, now you want me to redo it? drop another quarter million? Yeah, well, you know, it, it was, <laughs> the other thing that I was thinking of with that was because he identified the, uh, the male and female locker room. So if we have to provide locker rooms, the do you have to consider that? As, yeah, as we have had there. talked about that. We figure when the time comes, the architect is going to say, you need this, you need that. That's what, that, that, yeah. Maybe. Maybe. I, and only I, if, they, if they've been posed with that problem somewhere, like the yeah. Plainville thing, that if it came back and bit the architect and you happen to get that architect, yeah. it may come up. I think it's important for us just to acknowledge it to make sure the person's only good as, uh, is what they've been exposed to. So if the particular architect that gets chosen wasn't faced with that problem, they may not necessarily pick up on it. Yeah, I would hope that would definitely be one of uh, the questions I would have on my list when we met with the architect. But right. I would hope that, yeah. that that's what they do. That, yeah. And I would hope there's a lot more that they're going to recommend that I don't see or it's more think more about right now at this point because 
And I'm only keep mentioning it because it, it would be a very costly mistake <coughs> for us to overlook it. So if I say it enough times, everybody will be, all right, I get it. Yeah. Quiet. <laughs> What's so. the thinking now on uh, firearm safety in the locker room areas? You know, Bellingham has that sleeve that... Is that standard issue now in all new police stations? I, I don't know. I would have to look at that, but I it, th those aren't that expensive. The way you can load and unload and s safely. Right now, w you know, our general practice guys, you know, they usually keep their guns in their lockers, take off their duty belts. They either keep them in their duty belts, put their duty belt in their locker, and then they check it prior to. But again, that's. You know, your tight quarters, there's a couple guys in the locker room that are around guns all the time. They check it probably before they go out every shift. But safety-wise, exactly. I mean, if you don't have to take a gun out in a room to you know, inspect it, there's a lot less of a chance of an accidental discharge or something happening if you have the right equipment. But the belly game is in the hallway before you get into the locker room. Right. I think nothing can happen, but he just announced this week that he's not running for re-election. Jim Langevin, Congressman from Rhode Island, who was a junior high school, you know, police officer wannabe, he was in the locker room on some training or some other special event. The gun went off. And he got shot. And <coughs> paralyzed for the rest of his life. Yeah, awful. It's really not that expensive, but it's specialty and it requires more space. Right. Right. So all those special things. Evidence room, that Bellingham, for instance, evidence room is pretty mm -hmm. decent size. The person is working in there, so they have to be able to move around. And, and one of the thing things I think is going to be key for us is when we do get to the point before we meet with an architect, is go around and see some of these buildings. Some of these newer buildings, whether we decide it's going to be a public safety complex or whether it's going to be standalone buildings, go and see them. Get the input from them. What would they do differently? What do they have? What do they wish they had? What didn't they do? What did they do right? What what they think they didn't do right? Just so much better when I'm a visual guy, so I like to go and see what they did. And <coughs> Is that the only thing that made me uncomfortable in Bellingham? Was that community? Was the briefing room? And that was just like, oh my God, you you guys spent all of this money, and you didn't. They don't use it that much. Right. So the community itself should be able to get access to that community, that briefing room. Yeah. So it can't be part of your security arrangement. Right. It's got to be so that the select board or a planning board, somebody that have meetings there, that make use of all that multimedia stuff. That yeah. I find the chief Daigle I said, holy cow, I mean, this is really nice. Hmm. But when's the last time you used it? Well, it's been, you know. Yeah, when they first started, they had a couple of trainings there, and but they haven't had much since. Uh, <coughs> I know he was upset because he he felt that fire and police could have been in the, in the joint building, mm. and they're on two separate lots that are right yeah. next to each other, which is almost like the crowning joy of inefficiency. And I think to actually put them next to each other but not connect them. Right, and I think they <laughs> had plenty of room, didn't they? It looks yeah. like they had plenty of room to. That was do a personality that. thing. The fire chief in Bellingham would not agree to be next to the fire station. I'll talk my fire chief into it. <laughs> <laughs> I just that they were oil and water and it, it wasn't going to work. But yeah. that shouldn't be the reason why a building is built. No, right. Does anybody else uh, have anything, even if it's from your own department, any questions that you might have moving forward? I've got one more. Does yeah. the FBI or anybody else require physical security around See, just servers or the access to federal? Yes. Yep. F would, uh, you be, would, I guess, would you be ruled out from co-locating your IT room with another department's IT? It would depend on access to it. I don't think the co-location is the issue because it's going to be a locked security area only certain people have access. So I don't believe I could look into that when the time comes. It would just limit access for the fire uh, for the uh, the coal app. Uh, yeah, it's much use. like the detectives' the areas of the room. So like, if it let's say it's fire, then they wouldn't be able to just freely go into the room. Anybody, correct? Yeah. We never. I mean, based on like 
even our 911 room or when anyone from outside, whether it's Verizon or I don't know, some. Yeah, we, uh, we never leave them unattended anyway. Mm. Um, and most of the times it's it's vendors, like through sieges, if somebody had to come in, that they're all cleared. But it's right. not like we certainly, and I know the fire department, when we wouldn't just be opening up for anybody to go into our IT room mm. to do anything. I assume it would be the same with the networks would be two completely isolated different networks. Yeah, that I understand the, the IT piece of it because you have to have your own firewall, blah, blah, blah. But <clears throat> just the physical location. So if we had to, if you lost power and we had to reboot or <coughs> we're going to send some civilian in with a sheet to press this button, press that button, would that be no. allowed? No, it'd have to be someone on the clear list that's run through sieges. Fingerprinted. Fingerprinted, sent in background. But even in a shared facility, there would be no issue with having just two different IT rooms. Well, you're going to wire for power, and you kind of. I mean, it could be on the opposite side of the same wall. That's what I'm saying. Uh, you could have a dividing wall, but two controlled spaces. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I've got good money. No. So what I, what I would like to do, if everybody's open to it, is take a two-week break and um, use that time to try to, this is very close to what I was asking for is what your current um, use is and what your needs are and what your, what your projection is and there's a few little spots in there that, that it's not real clear. So I just wrote some <clears throat> notes of my own as we, uh, as we went through. Um, but I think if we um, <coughs> take a two-week break and just go through it and try to try to itemize what we have for personnel, equipment, um, what we're going to need for a meeting room, um, and that's why I was asking you about how many people comfortably fit in that room, and you said 10 to 12 people, and you're saying 25 to 30. So now I, you're telling me that you need a room that's going to accommodate 50 people. Um, for a meeting room because if it's a major event or something like that you're going to have fire joining that meeting it's not just your own personnel right um town administrator and whoever else may be involved in that so i would i would assume that just me guessing that their room's going to be that size that's the kind of information we're going to need as we go forward so when you get to an architect and you're saying he has a menu and it says, I read I have 15 officers and I have three sergeants and this, that, and the other thing. And the detective sergeant needs his own room. Um, these two sergeants can, sh and two sergeants can share a room and so on and so forth. That'll just help in the design portion of it. That's what I, I, I'm looking for myself from highway and, and fire as well as the, what they are. Um, and that's why I always pull back on that square footage thing. Mm -hmm. It's like, as we, as the conversation evolved, 14,000 square feet, when you say that to me, that's 14,000 square feet is a, is a footprint. But then Mark turned around and, and during his, well, it's actually three floors. Well, no, so it's not 14,000 square feet. It may be only 7,000 square feet or, or something like that, a physical footprint. Um, that's going to be important to Matt Benoit as, as we go forward with all three departments. If it becomes a joint uh, building or a three-way building, we need to know that. If Adam says he needs 30,000 square feet, figuring it's a, a flat area, and you're saying you need 14,000 of a flat area, and um, they're saying they need 14,000, that's a pretty big flat area. Mm -hmm. um, so just to help us get through that process and figure out how that's going to work. 
I don't know if everybody's agreeable to take a two week break. Um, I'll get yeah, with Matt and maybe we can, between the two of us, we can make up, I'll send you over what I'm thinking on the list and we can just um, neaten it up a little bit and forward it to the three departments and then they can give you back your menu of information. So we're we looking in February 9th? Yep. Yes. Does that work for you guys? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Barring any uh, major snow events or any other problems that, that come up, obviously. Does still that work cleaning for you, up from Saturday. I'm sorry? You could still be cleaning up from this Saturday. <laughs> I have a workshop that day. What works? 9.30. We can do it a different day that week if it works for anybody. We can just do it at a slightly different time. Do it a different time. Eight thirty instead of nine. Yeah. Is everybody available at eight thirty? Yeah. Yep. It, it should be much quicker, anyways, because we we've already gone through the the bulk of what we're going to do. So I think having a, the a couple weeks just to to fine tune your information for all three departments, I, I think it would be pretty productive. The next step after this would be uh, capital before building and facilities, or building and facilities and then capital. Okay. So we get through the next meeting. If we're we're in uh, agreement, what do we have to do? Make a uh, recommendation to the selectmen to get on building and facilities. Yes. Has anybody had it? Oh, go ahead, Matt. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes of January 3rd. So that's what I was just going to ask you if everybody had a chance to read the uh, minutes of January 5th. Nice job on these lists. Yeah, that's Stephanie. Stephanie, you too. Those are good. Lisa did do a nice job printing them out. That's yeah, okay. Yeah, Second the motion. Any more discussion on these? Anybody have any comments on them? All, uh, motion's been made by Matt Benoit, seconded by John Frano to approve the minutes of January 5th. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? I guess all that's left is to uh, a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. That's pretty yeah, quick there, quick. Ken. <laughs> so the motion was made by Ken Vincent uh, very quickly and seconded by uh, Nick to it. Uh, John. Uh, to John. I'm John. sorry. Took the credit away from John. The John Ferno to adjourn. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Guys, quick. I